Welcome to Dare to Dream podcast, the show that has been nominated for two People's Choice Podcast Awards as well as a Webby Award. Dare to Dream is ranked in the top best podcasts in USA and all of self-improvement on Apple Podcasts, as well as currently ranking in Sweden this week. This show is sponsored by Dr. Dane here and Access Consciousness. You can check out their brilliant work worldwide at drdanehere.com as well as accessconsciousness.com. Com. Debbie Dashinger is a certified coach whose expertise is visibility in media. She coaches people to write a page turner book, helps to take their book to a guaranteed international bestseller status, and she shows entrepreneurs the ultimate visibility formula, how to get interviewed on radio and podcasts with great ease and get really big results. You can get all your free tips and tools and templates and videos at debbie-inger.com. That's D-E-B-B-I-D-A-C-H-I-N-G-E-R.com. And if you want to write your book, we have just a few spots open. Go to debbie-inger.com slash visible visionaries. Is it possible to lead minds to brilliant results? My guest today is Dr. Paul R. Sheely, PhD, co-founder of Learning Strategies. Paul guides people to achieve extraordinary results in relationships, work, money, and health. Paul's unique combination of expertise includes degrees in biology, learning, and human development, leadership and change, plus a rich background in NLP, neuro-linguistic programming, accelerated learning, pre-conscious processing, and universal energy. Paul has developed over 80 programs to tap the vast innate potential of the mind to attain more success and happiness in all areas of life. Sharing how to activate these rich resources within the mind and connecting his natural power with spiritual wisdom is Paul's passion. As a gift, listeners can get immediate free access to Paul's seven-day Superpowers Super You Fest in a digital library. To get your free access, go right now to learningstrategies.com slash dare to dream. And we will give out the URL at the end of this interview. Dr. Paul Sheely, welcome to Dare to Dream. It's so great to have you here. Debbie, thank you for the invitation. This is a delight for me. Appreciate mm -hmm. it. Ditto. Yes. Uh, as I told you before we started, um, I'm not new to you. I've been listening to you for a really long time. That voice, that's all I can say is that <laughs> voice. So distinctive, I'd know you anywhere. And I was actually at a workshop on stage and one of your staff members was there and introduced herself to me. And when she said who she worked for, I was like, done. <laughs> I really must have a conversation. So finally you're here. And I wanna start with, the fact that you offer these transformative programs and it allows organizations, it allows individuals to attain this really quadruple bottom line result with also attached to it a really high return on investment. Uh, those are great words to any kind of consumer. So what is it that you in particular implement that allows your clients to produce this quadruple bottom line outcome? Well, the, the concept of a, a quadruple bottom line, Debbie, comes from my work in transformative learning, my doctoral work and research in conscious businesses. And one of the things that we've recognized is that a lot of the practices that we have engaged in over the last hundred years are not sustainable going forward. And so we look at how do we create businesses that generate positive returns in four different areas. A world that's socially just, that's environmentally sustainable, that's economically sustainable, and that's fulfilling for everybody that plays. And there is no more 
powerful entity in the world than business. You know, governments are limited in many ways to their geopolitical boundaries, but businesses transcend that. And when we bring consciousness to business, when we recognize what the real human resource is, right? When, when you look at an organization, they talk about human resources, but I would like you to think about the resources within a human rather than humans as resources. Mm humans have resources and most of those resources remain largely untapped as a result of the way all of us are raised and systematically degeniused through most of our early education. Wow, that's powerful. How many businesses have actually worked with you over the years? Well, you know, it's it's hard to say exactly because the products that Learning Strategies has published, all of my home study courses, all of the paraliminal technology, photo reading, for example, has been in 43 countries or have been businesses all over the world that have participated in it. In it. And the, the book, Photo Reading, has sold over a million copies. It was two and a half years as a um, on infomercials, for example. And this is a course that I developed, Debbie, in 1985. Wow. So you can imagine all of these years later, it just launched in China three years ago and it exploded through China. It was huge. So it's hard to say, hard to imagine, actually. But We've a big had some impact. Big impact. You know, here in Minnesota, the big companies around here and some very conservative firms have participated in my work because they saw forward thinking managers and directors saw the benefit of taking the approach that we take, recognizing that there is so much vast untapped genius potential within everyone. And how do we gain access to that in a cost effective way? I taught uh, accelerated learning. We were the preferred provider of accelerated learning to the colleges of the US Air Force for many years. And accelerated learning is a different approach because it recognizes every person has a non-conscious mind, not just the conscious mind, but the non-conscious mind, which is far more rapid in the uptake of information, more able to process as and is able to, to take very complex information and make it available much more rapidly than any other technology that we've ever seen. Mm. And is that because a non-conscious mind is actually a relaxed, expanded mind? Well, it's, let's, let's draw a little picture if we could. So if you could imagine a triangle, then there is the bottom, let's say half of the triangle is below a squiggly line. We'll call that the non-conscious. And above the squiggly line, that's the conscious mind. The squiggly line represents what we call the threshold of conscious awareness. So we have supra liminal, limen or liminal means threshold. So at the top of the pyramid is where we try to get to people in a in a educational setting. We want them to have reflective consciousness, the ability to look at the past, look at the future, compare the two, make a reasoned choice with higher order thinking and get to the full potential of their conscious ability. Just below that reflective consciousness is what we would call our, um, our, <laughs> primary consciousness or primary awareness. And right now, that would be what you're seeing, what you're hearing, the feelings inside of you, your internal dialogue, the images that you're projecting in your own mind. That's what we call primary awareness. If 
For example, right now, what's the index finger of your right hand doing or the what's the feeling of the chair that you're sitting in? You know, all of these are within our grasp of our awareness, but they're mostly not in our focal attention at any given moment in time. So then what? Then just below that is what we call peripheral awareness. And these are where those little side bands of awareness come in, those flashes of insight that tell you, like in an interview, what am I going to ask next? Or what, what image just showed up in mind? Because that's triggering an awareness in me that I want to talk about that. So right there is that's the place where the non-conscious and the conscious begin to interface. So all this rich resource within us comes up into that peripheral awareness. And that's where your insight, your intuition, your creative flashes have a tendency to come from. It's your non-conscious mind. But here's the important thing to get. If you could take the whole database of your conscious mind, everything you have learned that you could recall, everything that you've studied everything that you've witnessed, take all of that information, put it in a circle you can stand on, let's say 15 inches around. Now, if that was describing the entire database of your conscious mind, that circle in the center of a circle 11 miles across, that 11 miles represents your non-conscious mind's database. Wow. It's 10 billion to one more vast than what we carry around at a conscious level. And Debbie, look, we all think we're running the show at a conscious level. We're all making our decisions consciously. The truth is we set our goals consciously, but it's our non-conscious mind that finds the best ways and means to reach the goal. And when we start turning on the power of that non-conscious mind, our work life, our careers, our personal life, our relationships, our growth as individuals and as professionals, they all can take quantum leaps forward. Mm. Okay. So the non-conscious mind is our friend. It finds the very best solutions for us. And what about pre-conscious processing? What is pre-conscious processing? Oh, that's, a, that's such an interesting topic. So it's the idea, and this is, it's almost scary. In fact, the man who wrote the definitive work on all of the research that's been done in cognitive sciences, cognitive laboratories, realized that the human mind and brain, human sensory systems and brain can process any stimulus above absolute zero. So your eyes can register one photon of light. That's the smallest unit of energy we can recognize, that we can measure. The smallest unit of sound, of touch, pressure, all of this we're all taking it in, we're all processing it at millions and millions of bits of information per second. But the conscious mind is only re realizing receiving a tiny fraction of that. So for example, your eyes are actually processing somewhere around 10 million bits of information per second. But your conscious mind receives, and interestingly, a half a second after it's been processed, mm. your conscious mind receives 40 bits. Out of 10 million, you get 40. So you've got a part of your brain that's saying, okay, out of all this, what are we going to give Debbie <laughs> to, to pay attention to now consciously? And you know, here's the here's an interesting thing. We were talking about this before the show, how much noise there is around us all the time. And how do you get the signal when there's so much noise, right? And here's the beautiful thing. Your non-conscious mind is working all the time to make sure you get the signals necessary to achieve your goals, to reach 
the intention that you've established for yourself. This is so fascinating. And how, Dr. Shili, does all of this tie into paraliminals? Because just from your bio alone, your scientific background, I mean, it's such a beautiful thing to take, I feel consciousness and science and biology and marry all of them into these creations to help humanity. So I know I've experienced your paraliminals and um, I was going to ask you if you were still making them, but because I started doing your superpower course, I know you are, so that's awesome. But I wanna know like, what's the background? How did you even come up with this creation of paraliminals? Well, I have to go way back if I could. I, I always was looking for something to bring about a feeling of peace within myself because I felt kind of agitated sort of nervous, overly sensitive, easily overwhelmed. And, you know, if I, if I laid down at bed at night as a little boy and I prayed, I, I would get this kind of beautiful, calm feeling within me. And I wanted more of that. So when I got into my teen years and kind of got away from all of that and it wasn't cool anymore, I wanted to know how do I get myself to calm down? I feel so agitated. And so I thought, who does that? And I thought of yogis, you know, they put their legs into pretzels and they put their palms up with their fingers connected and they look pretty blissful. I wonder how I could find that out. My mother was a realtor and she brought home a set of audio cassette tapes. This was when I was 18 years old and it was self-hypnosis for salesmen. So I put them on and I got this progressive relaxation technique, relaxed me from head to toe. And I thought, that's it. That's what I'm looking for. So I wanted more of that. I studied mind development, mind control programs. I studied yoga meditation. I took Hatha yoga classes. And I really loved the experience that I had. I felt like I was bringing my crazy mind under this beautiful sense of control, a sense of calm and peace within myself. And I had the weird opportunity. My mother called me one day while I was going to my biological sciences degree at University of Minnesota. Hey, hon, what are you doing this weekend? I said, uh, why? What's going on? Well, my friend who's a clinical hypnotherapist is putting on a workshop and she needs to fill it out. She's got two doctors of psychology from Michigan are flying in, but she needs more people to take the program with them. So if you're available, we can get into the program. I said, sure, I'll go. Well, I met Zula Bowers and Zula, this tiny little thing, was told that she had two months to live. She was dying of an inoperable liver cancer and the day I met her, she had been five years past that diagnosis. So I knew something was up. But she so appreciated who I was and the possibility within me. She said, Paul, I'd like you to work with me. And I would like you to work for me. So I did hypnosis on her with her to deal with the cancer. And then she sent all of her clients to me. So that was my summer job while going to college. I was a clinical hypnotherapist. <laughs> like, how many of us got that opportunity? Anyway, that started it. That really did. And I was a fan of Earl Nightingale cassettes and all of the, you know, the uh, Nightingale Conant programs. And I was walking on campus one day and Debbie, there is a voice that occurred to me and it said, we don't need more cassette tapes to tell people how to live their lives. What we need is a way to bring them in touch with the resources that are already within them and then show them how to bring those resources forward. I thought, I'm on it, I'll go for it. And interestingly, it was 12 years later that the first commercially available paraliminal recording came out. Now the term paraliminal was in direct contrast to what's called subliminal. A subliminal recording is one where things are said to you, but you don't hear any of it. It's below the threshold of your conscious awareness. And as an educator and as an adult learner, I said, 
so I've made the change, but have I learned anything, right? And it turned out years later when I studied subliminal perception and pre-conscious processing, that the most powerful subliminal message, are you ready for this one? Mm, sure, yeah. Mommy and I are one. Wow. <laughs> I know what I'm thinking. I love my mother, but really, I mean, I don't want to get a thousand repetitions of mommy and I are one. So I said, I'm going to create this audio technology that would speak to both ears, but because I have my voice speaking to different messages simultaneously, it's going to go beyond your conscious ability to process it. And so we get to the same benefit that begins working directly with your non-conscious mind. And so that's para means beyond, and then liminal means threshold. So beyond the threshold of your conscious perception. Mm. And now you have over 80 of them. It's been a minute since I've listened to one. So I'm so grateful we're reconnected. Um, so I want to shift into the superpowers because I know through the superpowers course, people can access, you have a, a really special price, which I'm going to definitely take a look at myself. So because it's dare to dream, let's explore that. How do inborn superpowers, are how are they utilized for vital gifts? And what do you mean by superpowers so people understand that? Yeah, first of all, if you ask a room full of people, what's your superpower? They will know that they have some special ability. Like my wife could kiss our babies on the forehead and know within a tenth of a degree exactly what their temperature was. It was their superpower, <laughs> you know, or you might set a timer and let me know what it is. And I could tell you about four seconds before that timer goes off, almost absolutely or wake up without an alarm clock you know superpowers like walking on a bed of hot coals with in bare feet or to insert a needle in the skin and have it come out one hole or go in one hole out the other and then before pulling the needle out decide which of the two holes will it bleed out of the left right both or neither i mean we've got these abilities all of us do but some of them are more expressed. But Dr. Buckminster Fuller said, out of 10,000 children, we're all born genius, he said. We're all born genius, but out of 10,000 born in the world today, 9,999 of those will be de-genius by the time they reach the fifth grade. Now, you might ask, so why are we getting de-genius? But more importantly, when my wife Libby and I raised our three boys, we said, they're born genius. We know that. What we have to do is run interference to make sure that they don't get de-genius. And interestingly, remember that fifth grade idea that Buckminster Fuller spoke of? All three of my kids were identified for the gifted pullout program. So they would get extra attention and work and all that. They loved it. But when they were getting ready to go into the fifth grade, Debbie, each one of them came to me and said, Dad, I want to drop out of the gifted program. I said, why? Don't you like to work? Oh, I love the work. Don't you like teachers? I love the teachers. Well, what's the deal? Well, none of my friends want to be in it anymore. And I thought, OK. So I said, let me ask you if you would be willing just for one more year to do it, would you? And they said, yes, I will. <laughs> so they were happy to step into the power and genius that's within them. But you could see the culture was dragging them down to be more mediocre, to not stand out. And I think if we could just overcome, just break the trance of those self-defeating, self-limiting beliefs that get perpetuated throughout our culture, throughout our school systems, throughout our family systems, throughout our religions, we would recognize the true beauty, power, goodness, amazing capacity that's when within every single one of us. And people who would like to access or be very cognizant of what is my 
what is my gift? If I had a cape, what would it read? How would you tell them to understand best exactly what that is? Because I do feel like leading with that in life, having an awareness of that is very powerful when you can cultivate it. I agree. And if we could think about gifts and talents that are unique to us, I like to think that we're not merely human, but we're spiritual beings having a human experience. So if we could recognize the kind of power and potential that we come in with as like William Wordsworth said, trailing clouds of glory do we come, you know? We come into this human form with such amazing gifts and we're here to deliver those gifts. And others have talked about, you know, we need to live big. We need to step up and realize that our contribution is needed. And right now, at this point in human history, we're going through an amazing transformational change. And it will be for the next 30 years or so, perhaps 40 years. But this change was introduced back in the early 60s, in the late 60s and early 70s. There is a, a human potential movement that's begun to recognize that each one of us is carrying amazing brilliance with us that has to be given. As part of the evolutionary impulse that brought us, we need to expand into the world Otherwise, if we play small and contract, we're fighting against that very evolutionary impulse that brought us into existence. So how do you begin to find it? It really is a contemplative exercise first, but then think, you know, what do people recognize you for as being special or unique? Or what is a particular passion or joy that you like to share in the world? Another way to think about it is, you know, there is a, a colleague of mine talked about this heart virtue and, and it rests on the nexus between what enrages us the most and what we would most stand to defend. So what enrages me is when a child is being degenious. And what do I stand for is I stand to witness the genius that is in every human being that I meet. There are cultures that bow, right? They place their hands together at their heart and they bow and they say namaste. And that means the divinity in me sees the divinity in you and I bow to that. So when you think, what is this divine spark that brought you here and what are you here to represent? That's a good starting point to recognize the real gifts that you have to bring. Mm, that is something I've never heard before. Um, I think that's really easy to tap into the things that enrage us. And it's so interesting hearing you say that because I'm aware that it's different for everybody. Of course. This would, yes. right? This would not be a homogenous answer. This would be something so different. And what would you stand for? Yeah. Um, and that's very interesting about also showing us our path. There's another interesting psychological dynamic to this, Debbie. Oftentimes the thing that triggers our greatest expression, the thing that we're most impassioned about is the biggest wound that we received early on in our life. And so many people say, oh, you know, if that had not happened to me, I would have been so much happier. No, 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 no. That was the ignition switch to bring you to where you are today. So we're all in part wounded healers here to heal humanity's brokenness, bringing the, the human family together to resolve some of the really tragic problems that we've created for the earth and for our society. And we're it. Yeah. We're the ones. Wow. See? Yes. And I'm curious, your three boys, Paul, who stayed in the gifted program and uh, now are grown up, what are their superpowers? <laughs> well, I can tell you that each one of them is amazingly gifted. One is a truly a Renaissance man. He is a, an engineer, a rocket scientist, an artist, a musician. You know, he's, he's an amazing individual. 
our middle son has gifted us with three beautiful grandchildren. He's a remarkable father. He is absolutely focused. He's, he actually helps me with a lot of my video production. He's a brilliant, uh, he has a brilliant mind for the spoken word. He's a gifted writer. My third son is an adventurer. He did a first ascent in the Himalayas. He, he brings uh, people with disabilities into uh, the mountains of New Zealand. He is a world traveler and is a dual citizen of Australia and the US. You know, each one of them has brought such remarkable gifts forward. My wife is a gifted artist. And we've always encouraged engaging in the thing that uh, that the child wanted most. I remember when my third son was getting ready to go into the Himalayas and climb a mountain with an international team from uh, New Zealand. And this was on a mountain that's never been scaled. Mm in human history that anyone knows of. So this first ascent is potentially a death sentence, right? If, if things go wrong. And uh, I, I remember mentioning it to somebody and, and this woman said, oh, I would never allow my child to do that. If I said to them, you must not go, they would have to obey me as their mother. And I thought, how sad that we would stop out of our own fear, our children from discovering what it is that they're most impassioned about. And that's why I was talking about this. There's a cultural imperative to hold people back out of fear. And there are three big fears that we have to overcome. And if we don't, we remain in a place of what Emerson referred to as a life of quiet desperation, never really pursuing or realizing our dreams. And hey, title of your program, mm. we must, we must dare to dream, not only dream, but then pursue that dream, right? And that's what, this is where my work comes in is I have spent the 45 years of my professional life bringing ideas and strategies and technologies to people that can help them pursue their dreams. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's beautiful. And you said three biggest dreams, I'm, excuse me, three biggest fears. I'm guessing one of them is abandonment. Ah. <laughs> what, are, oh, what are they? Fear of public speaking. No, they're, they're actually much deeper than this. These are more archetypal. These are deep psychological fears. And if you think about the structure of the brain, it's actually mapped according to that. You've heard about fight, flight, or freeze. Yes. Right. So this is an old brain response to the reptilian brain, the most ancient part. You can think about it as a feeling in your gut. And when the gut feeling is fear, then what happens is we go into a freeze response. We, we don't want to move. We, we can't take a step forward. So think about this first is at the level of the gut, it's your will, your will to proceed. And if you don't have a will to do it, what's the likelihood of you going to be able to proceed, right? The next one is controlled by that limbic system, the midbrain, the emotional brain, which is really associated with your heart area. So when your heart is broken, it's because the people that, you love and that you think love and, and care for you might kick you to the curb. What will others think? If I do this and fail, what will others say? And look, this is a deep archetype because as a tribal species, if we got kicked out of our tribe, we're gone, you know, we're done for really. We must be in community to survive. So. This is a, a, the second fear, and it's the fear that I don't belong, or I might not be loved. Now, the third fear is the one of the neocortex, which surrounds both of those old parts of the brain. And this is where you could think about it as your head, essentially, your mind. And this is the idea that I'm not worthy. I'm not young enough. I'm not old enough. 
I'm not smart enough. I'm not thin enough. I'm not tall enough. I'm not short enough. I'm not whatever enough. I'm not enough of something. And this plagues so many people. So when an opportunity presents itself and that fear just flashes in front of us, we might pass on that opportunity and it would go to someone else. Like when that voice came to me, Debbie, about producing paraliminals, we'll, you know, build yeah. this product. I had, I had to pursue this one for a long time and it actually required digital audio technology, which didn't exist mm. in 1976 when it first came to me. It didn't exist, interestingly, until 1988 was the first digital audio recording software. And the audio engineer that I knew used to work at Paisley Park with Prince. I was talking to him and he, I told him what I needed. I said, it's like word processing. I have to take this paragraph and this paragraph. I need to put them together. He said, I'm the only one on the planet who can do it for you, Paul. Yeah, it was like one, of those, it was one of those God moments, right? When you're in the right place at the right time, successfully engaged in the right activity. And we can all be there when we're in the flow of pursuing our passion. It's as if all the resources we need will come to us. But if we stop at the threshold of moving forward on a dream we have out of fear, I don't belong, I won't be loved, I, I don't have the resources I need, I don't have the time, the money, the energy, whatever, it's game over. We miss, we miss the opportunity that's presented itself. Mm. And people who do have an aspiration and sometimes a buffet <laughs> of aspirations, this goal, yes. this goal, this dream, all these ideas and passions and interests, how do you recommend that people prioritize their goals? Well, I like that you said that as a priority. So here's the way I like to describe it first. The ideal future that you would like to live into mm -hmm. is a complex of many things that have been realized. So there's some kind of purpose or vision or mission. There's certainly goals. And if you back that off to the status quo, which is the present moment, there's a big gap between where we are status quo, haven't even thought of a goal yet, and you know the ideal future that we would like to move toward. And if you pick any major goal that you have, like let's say your finances, right? Your, um, your income, your career, your relationships, wherever you are on any one of those big arcs, pick where you are today on a scale from one to 10, everyone will know where they are in the present state. And if they say two, I'm at a two on a scale of one to 10. Or if they say, well, I'm at a seven on a scale of one to 10, I'll always ask the same next question. Why so high and not lower? Kind of takes them back. Well, I, I, I just said I was only at a two. Yeah, but why did you place yourself at a two and not lower. You see, there's resources in place. There's things that are already working for you. You're moving already in your life. So now, what will move you one step up that scale? Say from a two to a three or from a seven to an eight. And everybody always knows one next small step that they could take. And yet, think about it in your own life. Everyone who's watching or listening to this, think about it in your own life you might not know what step 17 is or step 28, but you probably know one, two or three steps you could take right now. And many people stop themselves, Debbie, because they don't know what 17 is gonna be. So I better not do it. No, 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 no. You won't know until you're walking on the path already. That's when the helpers come. That's when the resources come. It's as if the universe smiles and say, Ah, I know where you're going here. Let me help you out with this. But if you don't do the thing, you don't have the power. And you'll only discover your superpower by doing the thing that mm. you fear most. Oh, that's such a good quote. You only get your superpower by doing the thing you fear most. Mic drop. 
That's very <laughs> good. I, you know, when you're saying that, uh, I'm, I've never been a great linear thinker but mm -hmm. I can utilize in many things, even math, frankly, I can reverse engineer things. And so for me, taking exactly the example you said, Paul, which is where we are right now, our dream out here, and I can start here, out there and, and back up. Well, if that needs to happen, what would that step be? And if that step were to occur, what's the previous step and the previous and the previous until I wind up back here? I am, just because I've used it so much, I'm highly aware that that won't be linear to go forward, but that it's enough of a roadmap to take me forward enough that truly what you said, the, uh, the universe is a 401k plan. And it's when they know we're investing, they double quadruple invest on our behalf and, and really help guide and show us the way. I believe this, I've experienced it. That's a beautiful way of thinking about it. So I'd like to add one bonus item in there. Yeah. You see, you know where you are today and you probably know the next one, two or three steps. There's a big abyss right, of the unknown. And then there is precursors that will have to exist in that long-term realization of the goal. In other words, there are some foundational items upon which that ideal future will rest. So between here that we know, the, the very near term, and there that we know on the very long term, we know what it's going to look, sound, and feel like when we get there. And that probably some foundations or precursors are going to be there. What we don't know is the gap between here and there. And so there was a, a there is an MIT professor named C. Otto Scharmer that referred to this idea called theory U that we can't get from here to there. We can't get from point A to point B. What we have to do is we have to drop in. We have to have an open mind, an open heart, and an open will. And then we must become present to what's trying to emerge. And so we're letting go and letting come. So letting go of our old ideas and letting come what's trying to materialize. And the way I talk about it for people who are socially aware is all of us are called right now to have two important roles. One is to do hospice mm. for those systems that are no longer sustainable. And the other is to be midwives to what's trying to be born. And so I think that we're all in that role. If we're here on the planet right now, we are called to do this work. We're called to reach deep. We're called to hold the big dream to recognize that this is what we must do and dare to do in our lifetime, to go all in, will, heart, head, live wholeheartedly every day and do whatever it takes for as long as it takes to keep making progress. Now, when you don't know what to do, that's when the universe steps in. It, it gives us this presencing as this MIT professor refers to it. We become present to what's trying to emerge. And as he says, which I love this, is all of us are called to become landing strips for the emerging future. <laughs> so I saw that my receiving paraliminal technology from whatever that voice was in my head was me open enough to be a landing strip for this technology to come. And so, you know, here we are, some six, seven, eight million paraliminal recordings later in 185 countries. You know, Debbie, this is an amazing gift that was presented to me. I had to doggedly pursue it for 12 years in order to really track down how to make it happen. I saw you several years ago. I always follow the emotional freedom technique summits. Oh, and there you yeah. were with the Ortners. You had um, a couple of sessions that you offered. And yeah. I love EFT tapping. I do it myself almost every day. Is yeah. this something that you incorporate into your practices? Yes, very definitely. I have developed a protocol called the Joy Spring Protocol. 
So every couple of hours, you stand up, stretch, take a drink of water. You, you do some opening, you know, kind of stretch and then some cross lateral movements or a little yoga or a little Qigong for 20 seconds, some tapping for 20 seconds and then a brief drop in, which is to place us in touch with that non-conscious realm within us. The whole thing, the whole protocol takes about 90 seconds. I built it into an app and that app is soon to be released. So I, I hope you bring me back on your show so I can tell you all about it. It's so cool. But then we also have a special button on there. If you're in a mood or a, a state that you really don't like, you're in rage or you're sad or you're depressed or you're confused or whatever it might be, I'll take you through three rounds of all eight tapping along with uh, affirmations that I give to you that you say to yourself. So we have a profound emotional shift and we really recognize we're in charge, but we're not necessarily at cause all the time. You see, sometimes things happen that cause us to feel that way or a thought comes in. Thoughts occur to us and sometimes those thoughts are depressing or anxiety producing. But when they do come in, our response can be what we choose it to be. And that's really key is that we recognize that we have agency. We have the power to make a shift in the direction that would be more effective, more elegant, more um, on point to what it is we're trying to create. Mm, yeah, I'm in. That app sounds amazing. <laughs> and I Thanks. keep... As I'm listening to you, Paul, I'm hearkening back to what you said in the beginning and somewhere in the middle and, and really hearing your wounded healer. You know, how extraordinary that you grew up with this antsy feeling inside and really wanting to seek a place of peace inside of yourself, which has led you on this extraordinary journey and still today finding new ways to incorporate and implement healing modalities in really new innovative ways that I haven't heard of. So I like the soup you're creating. And that, you know, for all of us, that there's a place, if we are to be the ones who are administering the hospice on the planet and for humanity at this time, as well as midwifing what is next to come so that we can all continue, hopefully, and thrive, uh, that these, these modalities you're talking about are essential for us to make those changes and be here really thriving now. It's so true. And Debbie, what a beautiful summary to what we've talked about. I just love your mind. You have the ability to synthesize and recognize everything we've talked about in such a nice little mm -hmm. package. I appreciate you about that. And let me say that I studied yoga meditation with a master from a Brahmin family he had a master who was a Shankaracharya of India, the high holy person of India, Swami Rama. And he was a Himalayan yogi, came to the United States. My master was a professor at the University of Minnesota. And he was the one that taught a super conscious meditation on campus. I attended it and that was, you know, I was all in. Uh, he said, if you're going to study with me, first you need to know you're welcome to, but no mind altering drugs. That means no alcohol, no marijuana, no LSD, no anything. I, I just got to campus. What are you telling me? <laughs> I can't drink. <laughs> Do not Finally, deny me. <laughs> <laughs> I know. So here I was, I had just experienced 45 minute bliss and I'm looking at my hand saying, okay, Alcohol, bliss, alcohol, bliss. Okay, I'm in for bliss. So for seven, eight years, I was really disciplined. And I, years later, like 30 years later, I attended a, a lecture he gave and a five-day silence retreat. And during the, tr the retreat, he said something. This is, his name at this time was Swami Veda Bharati. Beautiful man. Passed away recently, but he was a most amazing teacher. At age nine, he was lecturing to 10,000 people on the Upanishads. I mean, he was 
brilliant, brilliant scholar, Sanskrit scholar. And he said these words, he said, those of you studied with me 30, 35 years ago, you know, I gave you a lot of disciplines and in my silence, I'm thinking, yeah. <laughs> he said, well, forget about all of them. At which point I wanted to yell, what? <laughs> you know, so he said, yeah, forget about all of them. Just take two minutes every few hours during the day and drop into a place of silence. At which point I did, and I thought, He's right. Now, as soon as the retreat was almost over, he pulled me out of silence into his study and said, Paul, I want to talk to you. I know you build these home study programs. My son took your photo reading program. It was amazing. He said, do you think there's something we can do? And I said, absolutely. This is what it looks like. And I built the whole thing for him right in front of him. And he said, that sounds great. When can we start? I said, I'll book up time in the studio this week. So on Friday, we did our first recording. We finished it in London uh, the next year, and it's called Meditate with the Himalayan Masters. And what we do is we take his best 30-minute meditation. We do four of them throughout the series. His best 30-minute meditation, and then right after it, a minute and a half to three-minute drop in to silence with an, an abbreviated technique. And it's magical because look, Debbie, who has time to meditate for a half an hour every day, right? Or twice a day, come on, it's not reasonable, especially with our busy lives, we can't do it. But here's what he said, whatever the mind does repeatedly becomes the mind's habit. So that's why I built the app to take us throughout the day, a few times, around a concept of one of five emotions. So we rotate through those five emotions, one each day. So today would be joy. So today, every time we drop in, we focus on our expression of joy and where is that felt it's in our heart, right? So we focus on that. Tomorrow, we're going to focus on gratitude. The next day, contentment. The next day, peace. The next day, happiness. So we rotate through these five essential emotions that are, you know, they go deep into Chinese medicine and Taoist traditions, but this idea that in a matter of a few moments, we can direct our minds to this place of deep calm and really end that ongoing suffering that we face every day. It makes mindfulness meditation super easy for anyone. Yeah. Wow. That's incredible. So meditate with Himalayan masters. And it sounds like you incorporated everything you learned from him and what you created with him also into this app that we'll all be yes. waiting for. Yes, and right and I, now, yes, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. And I wanted to say, and you know, we we're talking about superpowers. Mm -hmm. I yes, bring, him, I, I talk about this concept of the open mind, the open heart, the open will, I bring all of what we've been talking about into this program called the Superpower Super You, which we want to give to all of your listeners. Yes. So learningstrategies.com slash dare to dream is where you will get this free access to a seven day superpowers super you fest. I'm on day three right now. Um, and I'm enjoying it. I'm watching one every day. And so this library that we can access, can you tell us a little bit about it? And what was your mission in creating it for us? Well, I really wanted people to awaken to the fact that they have untapped resources within them. It's what we've been talking about since the beginning of our show today. It's this idea that there's so much that's been marginalized, that's been discounted, that's actually fully available to us right now if we would break that trance of limitation. And so the superpower, super you mind fest is a way, it, it's a, almost a full hour session. I mean, the sessions vary a little bit. And they last just for a day. So once you click on it, you can't go back to it, but you get a day to listen to it. 
And in that seven days, I'll also say for each of these superpowers, whether it's abundance and money or your relationships or your results or your powers or your body, your emotions, your mind, we go through these seven different subject areas. There are several paraliminal recordings that would support you in realizing what I'm talking about in terms of the exercise I gave you, the thing that you could work with today and get immediate benefit from. But if you wanna take each one of those deeper, there are these paraliminals that would be helpful. And then what Learning Strategies has done is they've made the opportunity available to purchase the entire library of paraliminals at a way reduced rate to what's normally available on the website or in a direct mail. Oh, okay. I, that was going to be my question um, because I was hoping that would be an option at some point. Yes. And you mentioned finances. So I want to ask you about that. So especially right now, it's, it's, it's interesting out there. And there is a frustration among some people because they have this real desire to move the ceiling, if you will, to go beyond their limits and to really build financial strength. To me, finances are freedom. So is there a way that people can live from an abundant money, money mindset, abundant money mindset that's reflected abundantly on the outside as well? So the inside outside abundance job. I, I really like that idea, the inside work that we need to do to have a mindset of abundance. So let me first define abundance and what's, how's that different from prosperity? So abundance is, it's the natural state of the universe. The universe is infinitely abundant. The amount of energy and power within the universe is incredible. As my teacher said, there is the light of 10,000 suns in every atom of your body. So we know how profound the universe really is. Prosperity consciousness is a degree to which we individually feel we have access to that abundance. So if you've been raised with a mindset, money doesn't grow on trees, right? As my friend Jack Canfield often said, his father grunted about every time he wanted to buy anything, money doesn't grow on trees. Well, Jack Canfield has become extremely <laughs> successful and he's one of the guest presenters in the Superpower Super You program. Well, the idea behind this is we tell ourselves we have stories about our relationship to money that are in the past, like humiliating situations or blowing it sometime or whatever. And then we have stories about our present, like how much I can earn and all of that. And then we have a future money story. What is our future going to look like? And if you tell yourself negation versus positive, which means POSI means to position, if you position your thinking with an ideal end result, it can come about. So I want to give you a quick story, maybe two quick stories if I have time. One is I realized that my business wasn't breaking the $2 million sales mark. We just couldn't seem to get past it. Year after year, million seven, million eight, million seven, million nine, million six, you know, just over and over again. And one day I realized this glass ceiling has got to be of my own creation because I'm an entrepreneur. The only person who is establishing my pay, my pay level is me. I'm doing this. So what am I missing? What is it that I have to get at? And I realized this metaphysical statement, seek ye first the kingdom of God and all things shall be added unto you. Well, the word heaven, the kingdom of heaven is how it's sometimes translated, means in the ancient Greek meant uranos, which means expansion. So seek first to expand. So look at you. You know, you expanded your interest in human development and transformation so you could share it with the world and look at what that expansion has brought you. That's what we must all do is expand our application of our gifts and our talents and our passions. But negation locks that down. It makes us play small. 
out of fear, we say, no, nah, it's not me. Oh, I can't do this. Maybe somebody else could do it, but I'm not the one. Oh, I'm so terrible at speaking or, you know, just being around people. I couldn't possibly. No. All of those negations prevent your true financial future from fully emerging. So we need to look at our mindset around money and recognize that if it is to be, it is up to me to expand our idea of what kinds of gifts, services, and talents could we bring to the world to help make a difference in the lives of those we serve. And when you do that, when you really serve, your financial rewards are guaranteed. Can you give me an example of a way that you chose to expand in order to break that ceiling? Yeah, for example, I realized that I was perfectly contented sitting behind my computer and writing programs. Mm. And if I got an invitation to speak at a big conference, yeah, I would do a, a, a concurrent workshop at those conferences but I wasn't stepping up. I wasn't asking to be on stage as the plenary. I wasn't asked to be the star of the show. And I realized, yeah, I've become complacent, mm -hmm. become happy in my little kingdom here because I'm not exposed. And I realized I needed to get on stage. I needed to say, yes, I'll come and speak at your conference. Mm -hmm if you give me a keynote presentation and people started giving me keynote presentations. So I began speaking at international conferences all over the world. And wow, what a difference that made in the very first year we went from under 2 million to three. And then within two years, we were at 6 million. And then a year after that to 12 million. Now, you know, you can, pinpoint the day when things change and when it when you recognize it was when my mindset shifted that said it is up to me to play big and once i did things really changed mm. so for, okay that's beautiful oh that's such a such a great example and it's really good to find where it's a little uncomfortable but juicy and step yes. into that yeah that's where the yes. gold is uh, and I think we all have to recognize if we receive a paycheck from an employer, it's because we're a valued asset solving problems that are given to us. And when we take on more problems, when we show more worth, when we want to serve more, then what happens is we're given more opportunities. I remember a woman who had been a housewife for many years, her children were grown, she wanted to go back into the workforce. So she took photo reading and then she started reading to get a job in a particular industry. She applied for a job and got it in an administrative position, but she started showing the value, the real worth that she had in a very short time. She was promoted to having more and more responsibility to the point where she began running an entire area of the business and traveling internationally to do so. She was a critical part of the growth strategy of the company. Now that's just choosing to serve. And I think every employer wants someone who's willing to take on more, who's willing to serve at a bigger capacity and who believes in themselves, you know, with an open mind, an open heart and an open will, get past your fears, step forward and develop yourself. You can serve at a much higher level than you are right now. And all of us know that that's true. All of us, we can bring our full powers and our full gifts and talents into the world. Mm. So folks who would like to do that, Paul's seven day superpowers, super you fest digital library free to you from him. Thank you. Is learningstrategies.com slash dare to dream. Tick, tick, tick. Go ahead and get yours. And we're here at the end. Paul, what do you next dare to dream? What are your future dreams and goals? 
Well, launching this app, writing my next book about the non-conscious mind and working with entrepreneurs is the big next shift. Because as I mentioned earlier, I believe that an entrepreneurial spirit, even if you are a wage earner within a company, it doesn't matter if you have an entrepreneurial mind, an entrepreneurial mindset, you can really make a profound difference in the world. And so this is, I would say, my legacy move now that I've passed the 65-year-old mark. And I got my PhD late in my life with the intent of being a scholar practitioner, meaning bringing rich research to bear on key concepts for business development and human development, really make all of our lives be the very best that they can be. Oh, thank you so much for coming on the show. This has been just a gem. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. Great conversation. And I'm gonna end today's show with this quote. We discover that our insecurities and our flaws are things that we actually need to embrace and we recognize them as our superpowers. All the quirks you've spent years trying to hide, they are actually your superpowers. They're what set you apart. They make you you and only you can be that. Subscribe to this number one weekly transformation conversation the next guest next week will be Cindy Dale, who also hails from Minnesota. So we're on a streak. She's an internationally renowned best-selling author, speaker, healer, and business consultant. And Cindy is president of Life System Services. She's conducted over 65,000 client sessions and presented trainings worldwide. She's a professional clairvoyant and she's provided intuitive counseling and healing to over 30,000 individuals. We'll be talking about her new book. If you're listening to us on podcast and you'd like to see myself and my guest, go to youtube.com slash Debbie Dashinger. And thank you so much for joining us today. Remember, don't just dare to dream, dare to turn all your dreams into your reality.